This lecture is on a topic of prime numbers. So prime numbers are absolutely fundamental to the study of number theory. And the reason for that is they sort of form the multiplicative building blocks of all the natural numbers. Um, so let's first decide what exactly we mean by prime. So a natural number n is called prime. This is a definition. If it has, uh, let's say, exactly two divisors, exactly two divisors. Okay, so one, the number one would not be prime because it has only one divisor. Um, what are those two divisors? So it would, I mean, certainly one would divide this natural number n, and n itself would divide this natural number n. Uh, so we call it prime if it has no additional divisors. So um, here are a few examples. So first prime is 2, then 3, then 5, then 7. Then 9 is not a prime uh, because, it, because 3 divides it. Uh, 11, 13, 17, 19, 23, etc. Um, so sequence goes on. And... Uh, uh, one other term, so so uh, a number is called composite natural number, let's say, if it's not prime. Okay. Um, as I mentioned, the reason primes are so important in number theory is that any number can be broken down into primes as a product of primes. So that's the most important, yeah, let's, let's write that out. So the most important uh, property of primes is this, uh, this property we call unique factorization into primes. So unique factorization is actually a property of uh, not only primes, but the integers uh, itself. So primes are fundamental to the study of the integers. What is unique factorization? Um, this is also, by the way, sometimes called the uh, fundamental theorem of arithmetic. Fundamental theorem of uh, arithmetic. Arithmetic, that's basically, um, that means number theory. There are sort of two uses of this word arithmetic in the English language. Um, so we're not talking about things like 2 plus 2 is 4. Uh, we're talking about number theory. Um, and so uh, it's an old word for number theory and also um, in some languages. You know, for example, um, this book by Sarah called A Course in Arithmetic. It's really a course in number theory. Um, Okay, well, what is the fundamental theorem of arithmetic? Um, it says that every, uh, every natural number n uh, factors uniquely as a product of primes. Okay, so example, 60 is not a prime, uh, so there are many things it's divisible by, uh, but we can sort of break it down as a product of primes, and when you do that, you get this. You get 2 times 2, so 2 squared, times 3, times 5, okay? So that's the factorization of 60 into primes, and... Uh, this theorem says, so this is actually a really important part here, this word uniquely, is that that's essentially the only way to do it. Um, and of course, so I'm, I'm, I'm counting things like, for example, we can also write 60 as 5 times 2 times 3 times 2, but it's just the same factors uh, reordered. So really I should be saying factors uniquely as product of primes up to reordering. Um, but that's the only way to do it. So for example, there's no way to write 60 involving a, a 7, for example or involving two threes instead of one. This is the only way to write 60. Um, 
you might think that this is a fairly obvious property of numbers, so you can't write it in two different uh, ways involving these basic building blocks. Uh, but it turns out it's way more subtle than it seems. And in the next lecture, actually, we'll explore, uh, we'll, we'll prove this, this property, the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. And um, we'll explore how in number systems very similar to the integers, uh, this property actually breaks down, or can often break down. Um, okay, before I go on, I should just mention, uh, so wh why is number one not prime? Um, and it's not really any deep reason, it's just we sort of define it not to be. And one reason we define it not to be uh, prime is uh, if, we, if one were prime, we would have to just state a lot of theorems differently and in a lot less uh, sort of, of an elegant way. So for example, this theorem would no longer be true that 60 factors uniquely, for example, because we could write 60 as, say, 1 to the 17th power times 2 squared times 3 times 5. Or we could write it this way, or we could write it as, you know, 1 to the 256th power times 2 squared times 3 times 5. And the, if 1 were prime, these would be different factorizations into primes. And, of course, we don't want to allow this kind of thing, so we just say 1 is not prime. Um, okay, uh, next question would be, uh, how do we actually find primes? So, so how did I get this list? Um, well, honestly, I've, I've just sort of memorized the first, uh, first few of them, but at some point, uh, I don't have them all memorized. So, so how would we find, uh, all the prime numbers if they're so important? Uh, we need to have a way to find them. So how do we, how do you find prime numbers? So we want all the primes um, up to 100, let's say. Um, well, okay, so given any one number, let's say 97, that's a good number. Um, well, is that prime? How would we check? We would try dividing it by a bunch of things. So we try 2, uh, 2 does not go into 97, neither does 3. Uh, notice we don't really have to try 4. We don't really have to try 4 because we already tried 2. So if 97 were 4 times something, that would also be 2 times something. Um, and we try 5, we try 6. So you might ask, you might think, well, this is pretty inefficient. Like, how, how far do we have to go? Do we have to go all the way up to 90, 96, for example? Of course, 97 is going to divide 97. Um, and you start to realize that we don't really have to go this far. We only really have to go up to, let me keep writing. So uh, we don't really need to try six. So um, we only really need to go up to this point here. So whatever the square root of 97 is, okay? Because if I had a factor larger than the square root of 97, let's say 13, so we're trying to decide if 13 goes into this number. Well, 97 would be 13 times something less than this square root of 97. Well, why is that? Um, if it were 13 times something greater, well, then that product would actually be larger than 97, right? Because both of these are, are greater than this number, and this thing squared is, is just 97 exactly. Um, so we only need to check. So we only need to, to check prime divisors, not even all divisors, see how I don't need to check four, six, things like that. I just need to check prime divisors up to uh, the square root of n. So um, if I want to check if n is prime. So, so yeah, let's say that. So to check if n is prime, I only need to check prime divisors up to the square root of n. Um, okay, great. So, um, but, but, but what, what do we want to do really? We want to find all the prime numbers, uh, not just check if any one number is prime. Uh, and it turns out there's a really ingenious way to do this. Um, it turns out to also be a, a pretty simple idea, but, um, a lot of the best ideas are like that. Uh, it's very simple and elegant. So, uh, and it's called the sieve. Sieve is a net basically. So the net of um, Eratosthenes, ancient Greek mathematician. And um, 
the idea of the sieve of Eratosthenes is, you know, say we want to check all the primes, find all the primes up to 100. Rather than going one number at a time, we're going to go one divisor at a time. And so uh, rather than explain this in words, I think really the easiest way to understand this is to show you um, how it works. So I have this, uh, this, this grid of numbers here. And here's how this is going to work. So uh, let's skip one for now. I mean, one is, is not prime. Um, one is actually a special kind of number called a unit. Uh, and it's generalized to other number systems too. Uh, but it sort of behaves differently than primes. Um, also, a lot of people like wouldn't even consider one to be composite. You have primes, composites, and then you have units, uh, which are sort of separate. Uh, but it's not, it's not a terribly important definition. Um, okay, so we'll start with two, and we'll circle two. Certainly, that's not going to have any uh, any smaller factors. It's the smallest number other than one. Um, and now, what I'm going to do, I want, I'm going to check. I, I really want to check to see if all these numbers on a chart are prime, but I'm going to start with the, with two, and I'm going to cross out all of the numbers um, that are multiples of two. So 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22. And I'm noticing uh, there's maybe an efficient way to do this. So I can just come down this column. So I'm going to cross out this whole column here. Um, and then the column with the 4, these are all multiples of 2. Cross those out as well. I'm going to cross these out as well. I'm crossing out all of the multiples of 2. And finally, this last column. So I think I got them all. Um, there we go. OK, uh, let's continue now. So I'm going to go to my next number, 3. 3 has not been crossed out yet. So I'm going to mark 3 as prime. And I'm going to cross out now all of the multiples of 3. Because none of those numbers can possibly be prime. Right? So 3, 6, 9, um, 12, 15, 18, 21, 24. I'm kind of noticing a pattern. It looks like they're, they're coming down these diagonals here. So uh, this is maybe the most efficient way to do it is by making these diagonal lines. 6, 15, 24. These are all the multiples of 3 here. just want to make sure I don't miss any of them. Uh, so cross out all of those, then I go over to 9. There's a big diagonal here. These are all multiples of 3. Okay. And then there are probably some more diagonals. They're sort of spaced in the same way. I think this one here. Those are all multiples of 3. Um, this one here. And finally this, uh, this small one over here. Okay, um, so these have all sort of fallen through the net, and the only things that are remaining are things that are not divisible by 2 or 3. 4 uh, has already been crossed out. We also want to cross out the multiples of 4, but notice those are, are also already crossed out because those are also multiples of 2. Right? So if we get something that's already crossed out, we don't need to cross out the multiples of 4. We've already done it. Uh, but we'll circle 5. That's a prime. Let's cross out the multiples of 5. That's going to be really easy. We just come down this line. Uh, this line has already been crossed out. And we come up to 7. 7 is prime. Uh, we want to cross out 14, 21. This is going to be a little trickier, but I kind of want to go down this way. So 7, 14. I'll make sure I go right across the center of these numbers so it's obvious which ones I'm crossing out. Uh, and then 28, 35, 42. Uh, 42, so we're getting crossed out a lot of times. Um, 49, that has not been crossed out yet. 56, 63, so I want to have a line coming down like this. Uh, 70, 77, 84, 91. Uh, so 91 is going to get crossed out here. 91 is kind of a funny number because it's actually, I would say it's the smallest number that, that really looks like it's a prime, but it actually isn't. It's 7 times uh, something. It's uh, 7 times 13. Um, okay, we crossed all the multiples of 7, or did I miss one? I guess I did miss one down here. 98 It's technically a multiple of 7. It's already crossed out, though. It's, just, it's 7 more than uh, 91. Um, okay. 
here's the amazing thing. We are actually done. We're done because if we have any number up here, like 97, like I was showing earlier, okay, the only devices we need to check are the ones that go up to the square root of 97. Notice the square root of 100 is 10, so it's really just this first row. After we check, after we cross out all the divisors of primes on the first row, we're done. And everything left, so I'll start circling them, everything left is going to be a prime. 29, 31, 37, 41, 43, 47, 53, 61, we've got 67 there. So the primes are the things that are not crossed out after crossing out all multiples of you know, things on the first row. So it's a really nice idea. Um, and 97, there we go. So these are all the primes up to 100. And we did that fairly quickly. Um, okay, so again, main idea of the Civ of Eratosthenes, it's uh, we look at a bunch of numbers at once and rather than consider the numbers one at a time, we consider possible divisors one at a time. So two, three, five, seven, cross out all their multiples and everything left is going to be a prime by this observation above. Okay, so next I'd like to just collect a bunch of facts about primes. So rather important uh, numbers. Uh, so facts about primes. And maybe let's start out with some of the more obvious ones. So, um, yeah, what do we know about primes? So, uh, all primes are odd, uh, except for two. Two is the only even prime. This essentially is because it's so small. Um, all the other even numbers, essentially by definition, they're multiples of two, so none of those are going to be prime. Um, okay, uh, here's maybe a slightly more interesting one. So all primes uh, are adjacent to a multiple of six. Uh, but again, there are a couple exceptions just because they're so small. So except uh, two and three. Aside from that, they're all adjacent to a multiple of six. We can see so six, we've got five and seven next to them. And then we have 11 and 13 next to 12. 18 has a couple primes next to it. 24 has a prime next to it. But all the primes are sort of clustering around the multiples of six. Okay. I'm not saying they're primes around every multiple of six, um, but... I mean, uh, looking here, it, it appears that, that there actually are, uh, but that's just because we haven't uh, gone high enough. Um, so yeah, all primes are adjacent to a multiple of six, and this seems like a, 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 a yeah, really a difficult thing to prove, but it's actually not so bad at all. So uh, why is this? Well, we look at the multiples of six, so we can have a multiple of six, or we can be one more than a multiple of six, we can be two more than a multiple of six, we can be three more than a multiple of six, four more than a multiple of six, five more than a multiple of six, and then the next thing I write down will be the next multiple of six. So these are sort of the possibilities uh, for any number. And uh, this one here is not prime. Definitely can't be prime, it's six times something. <laughs> um, what about this one here, right? Six. Uh, 6n plus 2, uh, these are both divisible by 2, right? So their sum is going to be divisible by 2. It's 2 times 3n plus 1. And similarly with this one, this is also divisible by 2. Makes sense, right? This is even, so these are going to be even. 3n plus 2. And this one right here is divisible by 3, always, right? You can write it like this. So these ones in here are also not prime, um, unless n is very small, right? So unless n equals zero, and then that would correspond to the cases two, three, and four, and so two and three are actually falling in that exceptional case there. Um, but you'll notice that these ones here are really the only ones that even have the potential to be prime, okay? So this is actually not a deep statement at all. Um, you just consider, you know, 
the possible ways you can be off of a multiple of six. Uh, you can differ by a mul uh, from a multiple of six. And uh, four of these ways just can never be prime, essentially. Um, here's another, another one. So all primes uh, end in one, three, seven, or nine, right? So not only are they odd, uh, they can't end in a five. Um, the reason why should be uh, fairly obvious because in base 10, uh, if we end in a five, we're going to be divisible by five. Um, oops, I forgot to put, <laughs> except for uh, the number five itself. Five, five itself. Okay. Um, let's see, what other facts about primes? Um, all right, let's go to a big one. So this is, this is proved by Euclid. Um, there are infinitely many primes. There are infinitely many primes. Um, if this is the first time you've heard this, uh, you might actually think like this, this seems really difficult uh, to prove and maybe, maybe we don't even know how to prove it, but it actually turns out this is proved 2000 years ago. I'm actually gonna show you the argument now. Um, well, so why might, what might we believe there are infinitely many primes? Um, well, well, here's the reason why, why we might not believe there are infinitely many primes. Um, because if, you see, like as your numbers get larger and larger, like imagine I have a, had a bigger one of these, uh, there, there's sort of more divisors, possible divisors that I have to avoid, right? So the primes actually do thin out as you get higher and higher. Um, however, they don't really thin out that much, uh, and there's still going to be more and more of them. Um, and so, but, but yeah, again, you could actually prove this uh, about 2,000 years ago. And uh, here's the proof. Uh, so here's the idea of a proof. Um, you suppose that there are finitely many primes. Um, okay, what are those primes? I'm going to write them all down. P1, P2, P3, <laughs> um, dot, dot, dot. I'm not actually going to write them all down. Uh, but if there are finitely many primes, there's going to be a biggest one, right? I'll call that P sub N. So this will be the biggest prime. We're pretending that there are finitely many primes. And what's going to be the idea of the proof? Uh, it's going to be that we are actually going to produce one not on this list. <laughs> so we will produce a prime not on this list. That's the idea of the proof. It shows that you can never actually uh, get all the primes. If you try to just put them all in a finite set, there's always going to be one outside of that set. Um, my not list? Sorry, exclamation mark. <laughs> Um, okay, how are we going to do this? Uh, it's a really beautiful idea. So what you do is you take all of your primes and you multiply them together. This number is going to be divisible by basically every one of your primes in existence. Okay, but here's the trick. You take that product and you add one to it. Okay. What happens when I add one? Well, our first prime is surely two, right? So uh, is this number going to be divisible by two? Well, no, because this part here is divisible by two, but we're adding one to it, right? So we're one more than a multiple of two. And we're one more than a multiple of three. We're one more than a multiple of five. We're one more than a multiple of every prime. So this number here is actually not a multiple, not a multiple of any of our primes in existence, uh, of any uh, PI, let's say. Okay, and well, you might think we're done. Like this is our prime that we we're trying to pr uh, produce. Uh, it turns out this number might not itself be prime. So, uh, but 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 I'll say like either so either this number is prime, either this is prime, or um, it has a prime factor. Uh, other than, right, 
other than these P, P1, P2, P3, etc. Okay, because it certainly doesn't have these prime factors, but it's possible that it could have another prime factor that's larger than these, okay? Or it's outside whatever set uh, we, we choose. Yeah, so if we take all the primes, uh, we're going to produce actually a, a prime factor that's uh, not in this set. How do we know it's going to be a prime factor? Well, if it's not, you kind of just keep, keep factoring. Uh, you keep going down until we write this number as it's it's um, pr as a product of prime factors, and those prime factors cannot be on this this list here by construction. Um, so that's it. Yeah, that's the proof. That proves that uh, there are infinitely many primes. Okay. Um, so. Um, essentially, this. This argument, um, so often when you see like a beautiful idea like this in an argument, uh, as a mathematician, you'll try to sort of push this idea further, maybe use the same idea um, in different ways. So, for example, um, here's, here's, here's maybe another example of this idea. So, um, let's try to prove there are infinitely many... Uh, we already know there are infinitely many primes, but let's say specifically of the form uh, 4n plus 3, okay? So a prime can only be 4n plus 1 or 4n plus 3 because it can't be even, but it could be 1 more than a multiple of 4 or 3 more than a multiple of 4, and we actually see both of these cases, all right? So primes that are 1 more than a multiple of 4, it's like 5, uh, 13, 17, uh, 29, etc. Uh, primes that are three more than a multiple of four, seven, uh, what else do we have? 11, 19, et cetera. And actually, if you write out uh, ones that are one more, one more than a multiple of four or three more than a multiple of four, it appears they're approximately the same number of each, uh, which suggests that maybe there are infinitely many in both of those sets. Let's try to actually prove it. It's possible there might be finitely many like this and then infinitely many in the, uh, of the form four and plus one. So let's actually try to prove this. The idea is suppose, same thing, so suppose there are finitely many primes of uh, the form 4n plus 3, and let's actually write out what they are. <laughs> so p1, let's call them p2, p3, etc., up to pn. Here, really, P, P1 is something in a form, you know, 4n plus, uh, 4n1 uh, plus 3, 4n2 plus 3. Uh, so these are all of the form uh, 4n plus 3. I'm just going to take those ones. I know there are also ones of the form 4n plus 1, but I'm just going to take the primes of the form 4n plus 3, and I'm going to multiply them all together. Okay, multiply them all together. And uh, with Euclid's proof, we added one. And the reason for that is we wanted to make sure that we produce something that's, you know, a prime that's not in our list. In our case now, we really want to produce a prime. So we're going to try to do the same thing. We want to produce something that's not one of these. But we want to produce a prime specifically of the form 4n plus 3. So here's my trick. I'm going to, I'm going to try to produce something in a form 4n plus 3 um, so for 4n plus uh, uh, I guess I could put a 3 there, but I think the way I'm actually going to do it is um, I'm going to do this instead. So 4, uh, four times all of them minus a 1. Okay, because that's, this is going to be of the form 4 and plus 3. So this is of the form 4 and plus 3. For some reason, I won't use the same end, so 4k plus 3. Um, I put a minus one instead of a plus three because if I put a plus three, then I have to worry about divisibility, divisibility by three, things like that. Um, so uh, this ensures that this number here is actually not going to be divisible by any of these primes here, including three. Okay, because it's one less than a multiple of all of these. If that makes sense. Okay. So for example, seven is one of these. I have four times seven times a bunch of other things. That's multiple of seven, but I'm subtracting one from it. 
Um, okay, so this is a deform, 4k plus 3, and it's not divisible by any of the primes on our list, which is what we wanted. Um, however, we're not totally done yet, so this might be prime itself, or, so this might be prime, in that case, we're done because we produced a prime of the form 4k four, four plus 3 that's not on our list. Or uh, it's a product of primes. Primes not on our list. So does that prove it? Well, it actually doesn't uh, because... If the product of primes not in our list, we didn't say what kind of primes those are, right? Do we have control over that? So they're, they're, they could all be primes of the form 4n plus 1. Um, it turns out that can't happen, but we have to, we have to actually investigate that. So if, uh, so if these primes, the, the product of primes that, that we can write this as, so if these primes are all of the form 4k plus 1, then uh, the product would, uh, would have also been of this form. In other words, 4n plus 1, so 4 times something plus 1. And the reason for that, we actually saw this in a previous lecture. Um, the reason for that is if you take two things of the form 4n plus 1 and you multiply them together, that's also going to be of the form 4n plus 1. I think we didn't see this exact example, uh, but we saw something very similar. So 16mn plus 4n plus m plus 1. And this is of the form 4 times something uh, plus n plus m plus 1. See, so a product of any number of... Uh, numbers of the form 4n plus 1 is going to stay of the form 4n plus 1, okay? So, uh, but we know this is not a form 4n plus 1. It's 4n minus 1. We're, not, we're also not also known as 4n plus 3. Um, so, one of these primes, not on our original list, um, it's not on our original list, and it must be the form 4n plus 3 must be of the form 4n plus 3 and we're done right? because we showed that either this is yeah either this is going to be of the form 4n plus 3 and prime or we can factor it into primes and one of those has to be the form 4n plus 3 in order to produce a number of the form 4n plus 3 as, as a product okay um so you might be wondering now, so so what about, this is another example, uh, what about uh, primes of the form 4n plus 1? Are there infinitely many of those? We just proved that there are infinitely many primes of this form, and we know that there are infinitely many primes. Uh, unfortunately, that alone does not tell us that there, there are infinitely many primes of this form. Okay, because you could have an infinite set and a finite set, and that would be an infinite set. Or you could have an infinite set of these and an infinite set of these, and that would be an infinite set as well. So this, this proof doesn't really tell us anything about primes of this form. And uh, it turns out, uh, this is actually kind of instructive. So if you try to do the same argument here, supposing there are finitely many, and then you do the same idea, you kind of multiply them all together, put a four in front just to make sure it's of this form. Right? And in this case, uh, I really want to do plus one. I want something to form four n plus one. Okay, so this is of the form four n plus one, or four k plus one. It's not divisible by any of these, because I added one. Okay. Um, unfortunately, uh, this number could actually be a product of primes of the form 4n plus 3. <laughs> okay, so 
this it might be prime and that would be great um because yeah this is a prime not in our list but it might not be prime and if it's not a prime this could in theory I mean, not only in theory you can find examples of it uh be a product of two primes let's say even could be many primes but uh, it could be a product of two primes of the form uh for 4k plus three Okay, in which case we will not be able to produce another prime of this form that's not already on our list. So this same argument fails. It turns out you can modify it a bit to make this work still. So this is a true state. There are infinitely many primes of this form, um, but uh, we'll actually postpone uh, this proof uh, until we develop some more tools to be able to do this one. Okay, um, so that's enough facts about primes. Uh, let's do something exciting now. So um, let's talk about some unsolved problems. Um, unsolved problems about primes. There are many, many unsolved problems about primes, and it's actually pretty easy to come up with them. <laughs> there are some very simple to state problems uh, about primes that are just completely um, completely unsolved. Uh, we have no, no idea how to prove it. Um, I'll just give you a few. So actually, I will um, I will defer to uh, Edmund Landau. So uh, it's called Landau's Problems. Uh, this is a mathematician uh, about 100 years ago, and uh, he essentially came up with a list of four problems uh, that were much older problems, but at the time uh, he was living, uh, the mathematicians just did not have the tools to attack these problems, despite them sounding fairly simple. Um, and actually, as of today, um, last I checked, uh, none of these have been solved. So they're still unsolved. Uh, a lot of progress has actually been made on some of them, but uh, the first one is, uh, can every number, or let's say every even number, can every even number be written as a sum of two primes? Okay. Um, let's try it. Uh, so, well, two, we can't do it. So let's say every even number <laughs> greater than two. Uh, four, we can write it as two plus two. Not three plus one, right? One is not a prime. Uh, six, we can write as... Uh, uh, so we better choose odd numbers now. So we can write as 3 plus 3. 8 we can write as 3 plus 5. Uh, 10 we can write as 5 plus 5 or 3 plus 7. There are actually two ways to do it. 12 we can write as 5 plus 7. Uh, 14 we can write as uh, 7 plus 7 or 3 plus 11. There are two ways to do it. So you get the idea. And uh, there's a conjecture called gold box conjecture that this statement is true. So this is gold box conjecture. Gold box conjecture says that every even number greater than two can be written as a sum of two primes. There's certainly a lot of evidence that this is, uh, this is very much true. So for example, if you have a number in the millions, there's actually going to be thousands of ways uh, to write each number in the millions as a sum of two primes. Okay? There, for every single number in the millions, there are thousands of ways to do it. All you have to prove is that there's one way to do it for every number. <laughs> and uh, yet, so that's still we have no idea how to do. Um, so, uh, by the way, uh, any of these problems, I would advise against uh, wasting too much time on it uh, because <laughs> Even though it sounds uh, relatively easy to do, and seems like it definitely should be true, uh, many, many uh, mathematicians have worked on these problems for hundreds of years, uh, and no one's been able to solve them. So don't want to discourage you, but um, just be aware that they're, they're harder than they seem. Uh, the second one is, uh, are there uh, infinitely, infinitely many primes? Well, that would be true, <laughs> uh, but are infinitely many primes, uh, prime pairs, so we're looking at pairs of primes of the form uh, P and P plus 2. Okay, so are there, are there infinitely many primes that are two apart? 
uh, if we look back at our uh, Civ Veritasenes here, uh, we, we actually see this happening a few times, right? So 1719, uh, 41, 43, uh, yeah, 70, 71, 73, 59, 61. Um, these are called twin primes. So this is actually called the twin prime conjecture. This is believed to be true as well. There are a lot of good reasons for that. Um, recently, a lot of progress has been made on this problem. Uh, so somebody named Yitang Yitang Zhang in 2013 um, proved that there are infinitely many Primes, prime pairs. Uh, so prime, pr yeah, primes, uh, yeah, prime pairs that are at most seventy million apart. <laughs> Which seems uh, like it's not so great because this is a huge number. Uh, this is actually a amazing result because uh, it's really the the the. Uh, no progress has been made essentially on this. Uh, I shouldn't say no progress, but but no, no sort of significant progress has been made until this, um, in 2013. And so the gaps between primes sort of, um, they're, they're going to be infinitely many that are smaller than this this number. Um, uh, the gap, the, the average gap size between primes is actually it continues to increase to infinity as numbers get larger and larger. Uh, so this is actually saying that uh, you can always find some that are that are this far apart. And recently, uh, that's, this has actually been reduced to, I believe, 246. Uh, last time I checked, um, might have been reduced even further. Um, we're still far away from two, essentially. <laughs> we want to prove that there are infinitely many that are two apart. Um, yeah, this is one where a lot of recent progress has been made. Uh, next problem, next one of Landau's problems is, uh, are there primes between each pair of consecutive squares, uh, uh, consecutive, sorry. <laughs> it's very conjecture, I think. So are there primes between each pair of uh, consecutive squares? Okay, so what do I mean by that? So we look at the square numbers in this problem. So we have 4, 9, 16. 25, 36, et cetera. And we see that there's some primes sitting in between. So two and three are primes. Uh, five and seven are in between here. 11, 13 are in between here. We've got 17, 19, 23 even. So it seems like actually there are quite a, quite a few primes uh, in between uh, these pairs of consecutive squares, 31. Um, <laughs> this is almost cer cer certainly true. So it's the same as, uh, as number one where if you look at uh, two, two very large squares, uh, there are many, many primes in between them. Uh, so this is almost certainly true, uh, but uh, no one's been able to prove it. This is called Legendre's conjecture. And the fourth problem is, uh, are there, we looked at primes of the form four and plus one. Um, are there infinitely many primes? Um, of the form n squared plus 1. So are infinitely many primes that are one more than a square. Let's look at the first few numbers of this form. Uh, what are they? So uh, 1, uh, 4 squared plus 1, or 4 plus 1 is 5. 10, I'm writing out the numbers that are one more than a square. 37, uh, 50, 65. Uh, should I keep going? I'll keep going a little bit. Uh, 101. Okay. So this is a prime. That one's a prime. That one's a prime. Mm, not a prime. 82 is not a prime. 101 uh, is a prime. It's not obvious, but you have to check. Um, yeah. And so there's a conjecture that there are infinitely many. So this is actually a, it's called Bunyakovsky's conjecture, but this is a special case actually. Special case of uh, Bunyakovsky conjecture. Um, Bunyakovsky's conjecture essentially says this for any 
quadratic polynomial that's capable of producing primes at least. There are quadratic polynomials that will never produce primes or you know maybe only once or twice for small values. So, so for example, we have n squared minus one. How many primes are there of this form? Well, we can write them out. So we'll do the same thing as before. So three, uh, eight, 15, just writing out all the numbers of, n of the form n squared plus one. 35, 48, uh, 63, etc. cetera. Uh, you'll notice really none of these are prime, except three. Um, and the reason for that, you can actually see it here. You can do some algebra here. So this is n plus one, this factor is just as a polynomial, n plus one times n minus one, okay? And this is actually telling you, you know, if n is large enough, you're gonna get a factorization into two things and neither of those will be one. The reason that we got three still is because if you put in uh, n equals two, then you're just gonna get three times one. And that's, uh, that's not enough to show uh, three is prime. Uh, it has to have some other divisor. Um, okay, so these are four unsolved problems about primes. Uh, one thing I should mention is, you know, are there infinitely many primes if we do something like uh, of the form a, uh, if we do something out of form a n plus b, for example, you know, four n plus three. 10n plus 7. This would be saying, are there infinitely many primes of the form 10n plus 7? Are there infinitely many primes ending in 7? Is what that's saying. Um, you know, 6n plus 5, uh, 12n plus 1, things like this. Um, this question has actually been answered. And it turns out there are infinitely many primes of, it, of the form a n plus b. Uh, so, so there are infinitely many primes of the form a n plus b, uh, assuming a and b are co-prime. The GCD of a and b is one. Okay, there's certainly not infinitely many primes of the form six n plus four because all those will be even. Okay, so so far in this lecture, we've been looking at primes in the integers. It turns out that you can define uh, a concept of primes in other n number systems as well. And so I'd like to look at one example of that. It's a rather fun example. These are called Gaussian primes. Gaussian primes, named after Gauss. And um, these are primes that live in the Gaussian integers. So what do we mean by that? So the Gaussian integers are, um, all numbers of the form a plus b i, uh, where a and b are, are constrained to be integers. Okay, so in this i, so I really do mean this is the square root of negative one. So this is uh, yeah, a number so, uh, such that when you square it, you get negative one. So these are imaginary numbers, and they live on, the, so, so these are Gaussian integers, integers. Uh, they live on the complex plane. So let me just uh, sketch that really quick. So there's the complex plane. In the complex plane, you have a real axis and you have an imaginary axis. And the number, for example, uh, 4 plus 3i lives right there. So four is the real part, I go across over four, and three is the imaginary part, I go up three. Uh, so here just uh, the usual integers. Uh, so the usual integers are a subset of the Gaussian integers. Uh, but I also have a lot more uh, Gaussian integers. So I've got i, two i, et cetera, I can go up the imaginary axis. Um, Okay, so these share a lot of properties with the integers. So I can add any of these, subtract them. I have additive inverses. Um, what else can I do? I can even multiply. I can multiply integers. Uh, we certainly need a notion of multiplication in order to talk about primes. Uh, so what happens if I multiply two Gaussian integers? So I get AC 
uh, plus uh, BCI plus ADI plus BDI squared. And uh, I squared, we remember, is negative 1. So this is actually AC minus BD, that's my real part, plus BC plus AD, I. That's my imaginary part. So the product of two Gaussian integers is again a Gaussian integer. Um, unfortunately, we can't divide these. If we do this divided by another Gaussian integer, uh, we might not end up with a Gaussian integer. These, these might become rational numbers. Um, actually, I said unfortunately. I should say fortunately because that lets us uh, study primes. So a Gaussian prime is a prime in a Gaussian integer. But what do I mean by a prime in a Gaussian integer? We have to be a little careful. So is um, a Gaussian integer, so an element of z bracket i, like that. That's how we denote this set of Gaussian integers. You can also say z adjoin i. Um, these, are, these are Gaussian integers. Um, that cannot be written. It cannot be factored, essentially. But how do exactly we say it? So it cannot be written in the form. Um, let's call our Gaussian integer n. So we cannot write n as a product of two things, uh, unless one of these is one, or something that behaves like one. <laughs> so what do I mean by that? So unless alpha or beta, so alpha or beta uh, belongs to this set. So we don't want it to be one or negative one, so that's pretty boring. And we also don't want them to be i or negative i. So why don't we want it to be i? That seems like an interesting factorization. Um, the reason is i essentially has an effect similar to negative 1 in a way. It's a little more interesting, but I'm going to put the negative numbers down here. So by multiplying 3 by negative 1, we just sort of uh, reflect over to negative 3. By multiplying 3 by i, you might have seen this before. So when you multiply by i, you essentially spin around by 90 degrees. That's, that's all you do. So you, so you, you just spin around, but you're the same distance from the origin. So 3 will actually go over here. Uh, OK, well, yeah, 3i. Three, three uh, what if we multiply this one by i? We get uh, negative 3 plus 4i uh, lives over here. So you see how it's sort of spinning around. But you're not really breaking it up into two smaller Gaussian integers, uh, two, one, two integers that are down here. Uh, I is just sort of spinning around 90 degrees. Um, and uh, <laughs> it's kind of, it's kind of uh, interesting to think about this because uh, multiplication by negative 1, you might view it as sort of reflecting on a number line. Really, it's more of a rotation by 180 degrees. So negative 1 is I squared. So you're multiplying by I twice. So this number, when you multiply by negative 1, it's not reflecting over here. It's spinning around 180 degrees. Um, Anyway, yeah, so here's an example. Um, so 3 plus 2i turns out to be a Gaussian prime. Um, here's another example. Uh, the number 3 is a Gaussian prime. So 3 is a prime in the integers. It also happens to be a prime in the Gaussian integers. You can't break 3 down any further. Uh, so you might think, well, all integer primes are also Gaussian primes. That's not true is very interesting. So here's a non-example. So 5 is actually not a Gaussian prime. It's not a prime in the Gaussian integers. And that's because we can write it in this way. 2 plus i times 2 minus i. <laughs> uh, so yeah, it's kind of neat. So 2 plus i is here. 2 minus i is there. If you multiply these two together, you get 5. Okay. Um, some more examples, like 1 plus i is a Gaussian prime. This one's also a Gaussian prime. Uh, if you multiply any of these by i or negative 1, anything like that, you still get Gaussian primes. Uh, 2 plus 2i is not a Gaussian prime because it's 2 times 1 plus i. Um, but you can sort of start filling in uh, Gaussian primes. Uh, 3 is a Gaussian prime. And, uh, and if you do that, you get, uh, let me find this picture. Um, you get a picture that looks like this. 
So what are we looking at here? We're looking at the Gaussian primes. So this is, this is a complex plane here. And uh, this is the origin right here. So this is zero. And uh, if we go this way, we're just moving along the real number line. So zero, one, two, three are the integers. So there's three. Three is a Gaussian prime. Two is actually not a Gaussian prime. It's one plus i times one minus i. You can check that. Um, uh, there's three, there's four, there's four plus three i's, not a Gaussian prime, so that's a good, uh, good exercise. Let me see if you can, you can find a factorization for that number. It's not a Gaussian prime. Um, five is not a Gaussian prime. There's five right there in the middle of this little diamond. Uh, six, seven, seven is still a Gaussian prime. It turns out that everything of the form 4n plus 3 along the integers that was, that was a prime is, is, is actually also going to be a Gaussian prime. Um, okay, but yeah, there are many other Gaussian primes. Uh, this picture, of course, has a lot of symmetry uh, because you know, if we can rotate and still get a Gaussian prime, and there's symmetry along this axis also. Uh, so really, we only need, need to be looking at an eighth of this uh, in order to get the whole picture. Um, I do want to mention one problem I just find really beautiful and interesting. It's an, it's an unsolved problem. <laughs> so it, it, uh, it's an unsolved problem about the Gaussian primes. Um, it's called the Gaussian moat problem. The moat is something you build around a castle, a body, uh, a stream of water to prevent uh, intruders. So um, a Gaussian moat problem uh, is, uh, there are actually different versions of this, but uh, the main version is, uh, can you, uh, can you walk from uh, zero to, so starting at the middle, uh, zero to infinity, let's say. What, <laughs> what do we mean by infinity? Where is infinity? Infinity is sort of any direction you want, but can you, can you sort of continue walking outward? <laughs> Uh, so can you walk from zero to infinity using using only the Gaussian primes as stepping stones? So using Gaussian primes as stepping stones. So the non-primes, Gaussian composites, I suppose, uh, are the uh, moat or the, the water. Um, and can we do it in a way that we only taking uh, we only take steps of a, of a certain length? So only taking steps. Of a, of a fixed length, let's say. Okay, that's the Gaussian mode problem. Let's go back to the picture. So, um, for example, let's suppose that we're allowed to step uh, in any direction we want. And I mean, okay, zero is not colored in, but let's say we're starting here. Um, so we're allowed to, to go any direction horizontally, vertically, and also diagonally, but that's as far as we can go. So we're like a, a king in a game of chess. So we can, we can only move to the eight adjacent squares. Uh, and then you can try to escape. So let's say we're here. Uh, we can step diagonally, diagonally again. Looks like we can keep going diagonally. Uh, but then up here we sort of get stuck, right? We can't jump to here if we're only allowed to step uh, to the eight adjacent squares. Same with here. Uh, we're, we're sort of trapped here. So you can kind of imagine there's a moat that's sort of flowing through here. It's preventing us from going any further. And that moat sort of goes all around uh, down to here. and um, Sort of traps us in this little castle here almost. Um, so uh, yeah, what, what, what step size is that? So like if we're, if we're allowed to sort of go to the eight adjacent squares, well, uh, this would be length one, right? But we, we really want the diagonal, so this will be a square root of two. So if we take steps, the square root of two uh, does not work. The Gaussian mode problem is, uh, is not true. Uh, but what if we take a larger step size? So what if we're, what if we're actually allowed to move, uh, what if we're actually allowed to move two squares like this? So from there to there. Well, uh, let's take a look at the picture again. So. Uh, certainly we can get up to where we were before, but we can now jump across here. Okay, so, uh, and then we can follow this bit and jump across here. Um, I feel like we're, this is really just like solving a maze. <laughs> um, 
uh, and then you can jump across here and then here. Uh, it looks like we can we can escape, or can we? I think we got stuck here. Uh, no, we can actually go this way. We can jump there, there, there. Um, it turns out if I made this picture a little bit a little bit bigger, uh, we're gonna get stuck here. <laughs> And you can try a different path, but uh, yeah, it, turn, it turns out you, you do eventually get stuck. And, and I think I think even if I just made this a little bit bigger, maybe maybe up to here, um, you'll see sort of where you get stuck. So there's another larger moat uh, sort of flowing through uh, this picture. So it turns out this is not going to work either. Um, but it does appear like there's some number. Uh, I think some people believe it's six. Uh, <laughs> the six steps. Uh, should be enough. If you can step up to six at a time, that should be enough to escape. Uh, but this is, this has not been proven. So this is, this is still an unsolved problem. It's an interesting one to think about. Um, okay, so uh, this will end it there. Uh, thanks for watching.